All right, good to see you, all of you guys. Wave at me a little bit. You awake on Sunday? I'm rounding the bend on my third cup of coffee today. So probably by about 10, 15 minutes into the sermon today, I will have hit my level of espresso that I like to preach at. How many of you know you have an optimum level and then you get to that psycho level <laughs> when you cross and you, you're like, what? I'm not crazy. You're crazy. I'm not crazy. You're crazy. And your wife's like, you need to settle down. Does that happen to anybody else? Some of you? Okay. Uh, we went to Portland this weekend spontaneously. And I know those of you that know me, the word spontaneous and Jake Schmelzer go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? No. No, I like to plan everything out. I have a, not a five-year plan. I have a 50-year plan. I know where everything's going, right? Where it's all going to be. I'm just having fun. But anyways, we did go to Portland this weekend spontaneously. And we, we wanted to save a little money. So we booked the hotel maybe just like a little bit too low on the star level. You know what I'm saying? And so we were there and uh, I, we forgot something that we needed to get a sheet or something from the hotel desk. So I went down, it was about 10 o'clock at night at this point, and I, I'm getting ready to get, I get the, what I needed to get the blanket or sheet or whatever. And I'm, I get ready to get on the elevator and this young guy comes in, he's probably mid twenties. He has no shirt on. Should have been my first clue that something was amiss. No shirt. And he, he, he's, his arms are all full of stuff and his eyes are just as big as eyes can be. And so my brain tells me he's on something, right? And you'd think that in this moment, if this, and obviously I have compassion on him, I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but maybe I shouldn't get on the elevator with this guy. But of course, I'd already walked up to the elevator and we know the uh, unstoppable pressure of I've already committed to do something, I have to do it, right? And so he's kind of looking at me and he's hunched down. I realize he's actually holding his pants up. So he has no belt. And he's, his arms are full and he's holding his pants up and he looks up at me and he says, my toiletry bag broke. So I'm holding all my stuff in these, in these plastic bags. And I realize his arms are full of like plastic gallon storage bags. And what does this have to do with the message today? Nothing. It's just an awesome story. Is that okay? All right. I, we'll get, yeah. Don't worry. It, we'll get there. We'll get there. But he's holding these gallon storage bags and he's looking at me and I'm like, oh yeah, no worries. And then I just can't stop myself. Like Jake, don't get on the elevator with this guy. And I get on the elevator with this guy. So then we're standing in the elevator and I'm up against the wall. And I know you might think, well, you're like a huge man. Why are you afraid? I'm afraid in this moment. And I'm like against the wall and I'm trying to appear normal. <laughs> I'm cool. You're cool. We're cool. Everything's cool, you know? And he looks up at me. He's crouching down and he's like, yeah, I, I, I don't have my regular belt. And he's looking up at me in the elevator. And then he goes, I must look a nervous wreck. <laughs> no, you're, you're great. Everything is fine here. Everything is fine. And then the elevator dings and luckily we got to the floor. Unfortunately, he was on the same floor that my family was. So I get into the room and I'm like, Bethany, please protect me. And I'm locking all of the, we literally thought, should we leave? Because there was a lot of sketchy stuff going on. I'm not quite at that level of coffee consumption yet today, but I'm close. I'm excited about being here today. And again, that had nothing to do with the sermon. It was just an awesome story. I didn't even plan to tell it, but I liked it. It was great. Are you entertained? Awesome. Well, we're starting a brand new series this morning called Give It Away. Somebody say, give it away. Give it, give it away. And we're going to talk about this brand new way to be human that Jesus instituted, that Jesus uh, taught us how to live. And it's so interesting because a lot of people have this conception of what it means to be a Christian, which is basically someone who is marginally better than the people around them and lets other people know that. And it's not exactly the case. Being a Christian isn't about just having better behaviors or believing certain doctrines or dogmas or whatever. That's not really what it is. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at what Jesus, how he taught us to live, how he taught us to be, and how that is diametrically opposed to the natural, normal way of life. Kind of how we're wired and uh, to operate and how to think. Jesus instituted a brand new thing. And we're going to talk about learning how to give our lives away. And we're going to get into the word here in just a second. But I want to tell you a story. When I was young, my sister had a friend and this friend of hers, it was a boy and he had an enormous head. And I don't mean metaphorically. <laughs> he actually just had a ginormous noggin. His head was very large. He looked like a bobblehead before those were popular. You know what I mean? You could just boing. And, uh. <laughs> Anyways, this friend of my sister's, we went on a boat. My aunt had a speed boat. So we were on a lake in Southern Oregon. And somehow they tricked me into going outside. I don't know how, but probably said, hey, there's candy or something. I don't know. But I get on this boat and we were um, having fun, as people say, outside. <laughs> 
And so, thank you, Brittany. She's on fire today. She's laughing at all the jokes. The rest of you can step it up, but she's, you're doing good. Um, so we're out there on the lake and my sister's friend, it's his turn to go kneeboarding. How many have you ever done this, right? Kneeboarding, stuff like that. How many of you enjoy it? Cool. Just being towed by a really powerful machine, right? That's awesome. But so I actually did enjoy it. It was great. So I did it. I did my thing. And I think I maybe got up for like half a second and then ate water and crashed and drank half the lake and then got back on the boat and congratulated myself like I achieved something in life. And now it's my sister's friend's turn. So he goes out. And I think this was his very first time boating and, and going doing this water sport. So he is on the kneeboard. And I don't think anybody had ever clued him into this really important detail. When you fall... Let go of the rope. How many of you know the devil's in the details, right? Like there's some important stuff in life. Oh, <laughs> no, I must look a nervous wreck. You do. So anyways, he's on the, he goes kneeboarding. He actually gets up, you know, and then all of a sudden the, the kneeboard kind of shoots off and we're like, okay, let go. And he doesn't let go. Because I think that he thought, if I let go, I'm done. I'm gone. The boat's going to leave me. And I think he thought it was his job to hold on to the rope until the boat stopped. But that's not what happens, right? You let go, and then you circle around, and you get him. So I look back, and this kid with the enormous head, he's holding on to the rope. And I kid you not, he looks up, and I can see his face magnified because there's a wave of water, right? A perfectly clear wave of water magnifying his face. It's abject terror, mouth open, <laughs> right? And, and I can see this wave of water and there he is holding on to the rope. And so we're screaming, let it go, let go. <laughs> and it went on so long. And finally the boat stopped and he still had that rope in his hands. Now, how many of you know in life, there are times when you're supposed to let go and not just hold on. And yet, if you don't understand this detail or when this principle actually comes to bear in a particular situation, you're gonna be holding on to things that you should really be letting go of. And that happens to us so much. And it, and it happens to us in some really significant ways. And the reason is because we're deceived. We think that it, our safety, our security, our fulfillment is going to be when we are holding on to certain things. When I hold on to my resources, my finances, when I hold on to my time, when I hold on to who I let into my life and who I don't let into my life, when I hold on, then I'm secure, then I'm safe and I'm fulfilled. And Jesus brought a completely different perspective to this planet. He said, actually, you're free and you're fulfilled, not when you hold on, but when you let it go. And Jesus offers us a brand new way to live, a new way to be human. How many of you are Switchfoot fans? The old band Switchfoot, and they have that song, there's a new way to be human, right? Really cool. You can look it up on Spotify. Really, really cool. What if this path to satisfaction and fulfillment in our lives is about giving our lives away rather than holding on to them? And so in this series, we're gonna look at this, how to give our lives away. Look at this radically new way of thinking. Look at this entirely new way to be human. And we're going to talk about a couple of really key categories when it comes to giving our life away. We're going to talk about service. We're going to talk about justice. We're going to talk about generosity. Learning how to embrace this way of life where we're not holding on, we're letting go, we're giving it away. Now, there's a famous passage of scripture that I want to just go into. It's in Matthew chapter 16. And it's a great uh, passage it says in verse 24 of Matthew 16, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, in other words, if you want to walk with me, if you want to look like I look and do what I do and you want to follow me and what I do, he says, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. And then he says this, and I know many of you have heard these words. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. In other words, you think that holding on to the rope is the right way, but actually you're going to be in trouble when you hold on. You need to let go. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. If you hold on to your life, try to hang on to it, you will lose it. But if you give it up for my sake, if you give it away, you will save it. This is a, a brand new way of thinking, a new paradigm that's very different than the way that we naturally think, isn't it? But I want to go back into this passage. I won't read all the verses here just to save some time, but 
In Matthew 16, there's an interesting context that if we understand it, it actually illuminates what's happening in this verse. You see, Jesus, in the beginning of this passage, he begins to tell his disciples, guys, listen, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And the, the, the chief priests and the scribes, these people, they're going to they're gonna crucify me. They're going to put me to death. Uh, I'm going to suffer these things. And, and, and this is what's going to happen to me. And he's prophesying the fact that he's going to lay his life down for the world and die on the cross. And Peter, his disciple, well-meaning, always has his foot in his mouth. Peter says, no, he takes Jesus aside. He says, Jesus, that is not going to happen. Never going to happen, Jesus, because when the time comes, I'm going to stand with you. Now, it's interesting because Peter, is this, in Greek is this word Petra, and it means rock. And Jesus actually gave Peter this name because Peter's real name is Simon, which means reed. And it's this reed, like a brush reed that, you know, bends with the wind. And so Simon's character, who he really was, is this reed who gets pushed side to side and sways with whatever the emotion is, is at in, in the room. Peter goes that way, or Simon goes that way. Jesus says, hey, I'm going to call you Peter. Your name is now Simon Peter. You were the reed, but now you're the rock. Okay, there's a lot going on here. Peter's the rock. But then Jesus turns to Peter, who says, Jesus, you can't die on the cross. And how many of you are glad Peter didn't get his way? I am, because, uh, yeah, we kind of depend on the fact that Jesus died on the cross, right? And Peter, who's supposed to be the rock, Jesus says, hey, you're a stumbling block to me. In other words, you're being stubborn and hard-headed, and I'm tripping over you. You don't make Jesus trip, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> Jesus, he wears sandals. He doesn't like to kick his feet on a rock. Come on. He's not wearing steel-toed boots here. That's a good joke, you guys. Come on. We need to <laughs> just ramp it up this morning. Christian jokes for days. All right. So I can go full pastor joke mode if I can't get some laughs here. I'm serious. I'll start telling dad jokes, your know, mama jokes. I mean, we'll just, we'll just ramp it up. So Peter, Jesus says, Peter, he rebukes him, it says. He says, get behind me, Satan. If Jesus calls you Satan, that's not a good day. <laughs> he says, you are mindful of the things of man, but not the things of God. You're trying to thwart the very purpose that I came here for, to lay my life down and give it away. See, there's something beyond just the fact that Jesus wants Peter to understand his purpose is more than that. See, Jesus is actually instituting a brand new way to be human. And Peter is trying to bring the old way and saying, no, Jesus, we're gonna save your life. We're gonna hold on to your life. We're gonna make sure you're safe and secure. And Jesus says, no, Peter, you don't understand. This is not... That's not the point. The point is that if I don't actually give it away, then my life investment, what I came to do will not happen. Listen, all around you, there's, there's Peters that are coming to you in, these, in various moments and saying, you know what? That church is asking too much of you. You know what? That group that you go to, that's too much. You need to take some me time. You, 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 need, to, you need to hold on to your life, right? You, you, need to, you need to make sure that everything is in balance. Listen, guys, it's, it's okay to take care of yourself. And we're all about that. We, we talk about being emotionally healthy. But listen, at the end of the day, you are living and spending your life on and for something. And you better, you better be sure that what you're spending it for is worthwhile in eternity versus just making yourself comfortable now. And, and we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. Listen, if you want to follow Jesus, you're going to have to be willing to let go of some stuff and get a little bit uncomfortable. Come on, get a little bit challenged. How many of you know being a disciple, a follower of Jesus isn't just about, well, I do the very least I possibly can. No, it's about saying, you know what? God did everything for me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him my life and allow him to lead me into everything that he has. Now listen, it's not all bad and hard and, and dangerous. When you give your life to Jesus, when you give it away for his sake, what he says is you'll find it. So you actually find fulfillment. And it's a powerful thing. So that's what we're talking about. But the context of this whole passage, Jesus is saying, I need to go to the cross. I need to give my life away. And he rebukes Peter. And that's when he delivers these words. If you try to hang on to your life, he says, listen, you think this way, but I'm going to bring this brand new way of thinking. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you can't just give your life up for anything and find it, right? It has to be for the sake of Christ, for the right purpose. He says, you will save it. Then he goes on to say, what use is it for a person to gain the whole world, but lose their own soul? What is actually at stake in these mindsets of either holding on or letting go? What is at stake in this 
decision that we all have to make on a daily basis to either hold on to our life or give it away for the sake of Christ, what hangs in the balance is our very soul. And I don't mean necessarily, well, do you go to heaven when you die or go to hell when you die or whatever? No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about literally what makes you, you, your soul, the breath of God that has been breathed into you. You will not find fulfillment and actualization in a life lived for yourself. Jesus says, do you want to actually connect with who you were made to be? You got to learn to give your life away for the right reason. So how can we embrace this new way to be human? I want to give you three ways this morning. Number one comes right out of the scripture in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus says, if you want to live this way, if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. You ever heard somebody say it's my way or the highway? Almost always you choose the highway. Just some life advice. When you are saying it's my way or the highway, you should probably hit the road, Jack, right? (laughs) Count to 10 or whatever. But we have this idea of our own way. How many of you are, like me, are experts in your own opinion? You're always so much in agreement with how you think. So much in agreement with the way you see the world. How could they vote for them? How could they vote for that person? How could they do this? And we think my way is the right way. Do you know, nobody who thinks that they're in with God, like, man, I'm good with God. Nobody who thinks that ever questions it, which is where this like Pharisees and religious come from. Nobody who's not right with God. Everybody thinks they're right, which means we're either all, we're all wrong in some way, right? But we're experts in our own opinion. Jesus says, look, you got to give up your own way. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, there's a path before each person that seems right but it ends in death. There's a path. There's a way of life. There's a a mindset. There's there's a system of beliefs and values and thoughts that you can embrace and take in from our culture that seems right. But it's not right. And the result is death. The result is a soul that never realizes who, what God made it to be. What if our vision is flawed? What if what we think will satisfy us will actually leave us empty? And it's interesting because Jesus invites us to abandon our own way. In another translation, this verse, he says, deny yourself, give up your own cause. Stop being the advocate for your comfort and your promotion. Stop being your own biggest fan and start looking to be others centric and God-centric. Stop trying to guard all of your, your resources and guard your time and guard yourself. Learn to deny yourself. Give up your own cause. This is why Jesus said you have to be like a child to enter into God's kingdom. Because what you have to do is come to this place of complete and utter trust in God. Trusting in the Father. Saying, God, I'm not going to look to satisfy myself in whatever means and ways I can figure out to do so. But I'm going to trust in you to provide for me, to satisfy me, to fulfill me. I'm not going to go my own way. I'm not going to hold on to my way of thinking. God, I'm going to open myself in humility to trust in you. And it's powerful, isn't it? When Jesus spoke in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, I love this story in John 4 because this woman has multiple levels of problems. She has a a problem with relationships. She has a bunch of men in her life and she's looking for fulfillment there. And she has a spiritual problem. She wants living water that Jesus talks about. She doesn't know where to get it. She also has a religious problem because she says, well, the Samaritans say you should worship on this mountain. Jesus, the Jews say worship on this other mountain and we're not even allowed to go to that mountain. So how would I even connect with God? And Jesus, he solves all of her problems because he invites her into a way of life to follow him. Listen, all of us right now are facing conundrums, facing situations, facing problems. We've got maybe that spiritual problem, that religious problem, maybe that relational problem, whatever it is. And there's a temptation. And what culture is going to tell you is you got to hold on to your life. You got to hold on to your life. You got to work on you. You got to focus on you. You got to put your mind on yourself. You got to be, your time needs to be for you. This is my time. This is me time. Come on. This is my time to be my time for therapy. This is my time to get everybody to help me with my problems. And Jesus says, if you keep focusing on you, it's going to, it's going to break down. And what you think you're going to get at the end of that race is not going to be the prize you want to receive. But if you will lay your life down, if you will give it away, if you will trust in God, if you will stop looking to go your own way, 
I've got living water for you. I've got a way that maybe doesn't seem natural or right to your natural mind, but it leads to life, not to death. So Jesus invites us, number one, to give up our own way. And this is a lot easier to say on a Sunday morning sitting with your buddies at church than it is to do on Monday, isn't it? When you go to work and that person that is always ragging you for whatever, or, or in a marriage that's on the rocks and all of a sudden you're like, give up my way? Well, no, my way or the highway, Jesus invites us to take another path. Number two, in verse 24 of Matthew 16, Jesus says, you must give up your own way. And the second thing he says, take up your cross. Take up your cross. Now, before the cross became infused with religious imagery, because I know a lot of us have maybe had some experiences in church where we, we know what the cross is. Well, Jesus died on the cross, right? That's what the cross is about. But at this point in history, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he didn't die on the cross yet. So all they knew of the cross when he says this is that that is a Roman execution device. To put it kind of more bluntly, in our culture, we might say, hey, I'm inviting you to give up your own way and take up your electric chair. To take up your lethal injection. What? (laughs) This is the bluntness of what Jesus is saying. He's saying this thing that people are crucified on, they're executed on this most horrendous level of death. Jesus says, not only should you take up a cross, he says, take up your cross. Meaning there's a specific level of death that is required when we talk about experiencing the life that comes in Christ. How many of you know you can't have a resurrection without death? Jesus has to die on the cross before he can be raised to life. How many of you think that something has to die before we actually experience resurrection life in Christ. And what Jesus is saying is, look, when you follow me, you're going to see your own way and think that's right, but it leads to death. And then you're going to see my way and guess what it's going to look like to you? Participation prize. It's going to look like death. Your way is going to look like life. Well, if I feed my my appetites, if I give in to my own way, it's going to lead me to fulfillment. I'll, I'll find my life. And Jesus says, no, it leads to death. But if you follow me, you're going to take up your cross. And what is the cross? The cross looks like what? Death. It looks like pain. It looks like sacrifice. It looks like execution. Did you know when Jesus invites you to follow him, he says, look, you're going to look at my path and you know what it's going to be like and look like? It's going to look like death because you're not going to want to get up and go and serve. You're not going to want to be kind to the person who's mean to you. You're going to have to give up your own way. And you know what it's going to feel like? Death. But guess what? He says, take up your cross, the means of your own death. But the scriptures say that Jesus endured his cross. He endured the shame for the joy that was set before him. Let me just tell you right now, when you walk what even looks like death or feels like death as a follower of Jesus at the end of the line is resurrection life. You see our culture, everybody thinks I'm walking towards life, but they're not. They're walking like lemmings over the cliff. But a true follower of Christ walks into the death of themselves, their selfishness, the, the, the thing that has taken root and hold of their heart, their fallenness and allows God to bring them through a process of death where they die to themselves, but at the end of it, they, it leads to life. That's why the Bible says that broad is the path to destruction, narrow is the way to life, and few that find it because it looks like death. But if you can see this and you can get a sight of it, you realize, man, the cross of Christ is life. That when I will die to myself, when I will die to my selfishness, when I will die to my ambitions, and I will lay my life down for the cause of Christ, what will ultimately happen is resurrection life. Come on, it's a beautiful thing. But we all have a cross to bear, our cross to bear. And Jesus says, come on, you want to follow me? Put it on your back. Take up your cross daily. Put it on your back and say, I'm willing to die for the life, for the joy, for the peace, for the fulfillment, for what Jesus has for me. Are you going to trust him? Give up your own way. Take up your cross. And then last, he says, follow me. Follow me. And I love these words, follow Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is a huge part of what we are as a church is we want to help every single person take the next step with Jesus, to follow Jesus. But listen, this, this has so much meaning. This word follow here, it doesn't just mean to follow at a distance. It means to accompany It means to walk with. 
You know, it means to be around and with Jesus. Is he leading the pack? Absolutely. But it's not like we're all in a line, kind of like this death march. Everybody march, march, march. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. Had to get home with your left or right. You had to get home, right? We think about the Christian life in this way, don't we? Duty, duty, pray every day. So boring. Oh my God, it's Leviticus again on the Bible reading plan. You know, and this death march following Jesus, you know? Oh my God, I'm on dream team again. The nursery workers never show up and it's always me. You know, and we have this idea of what it means to follow Jesus, of following Jesus is this death march, but it's not. Jesus says, follow me. And what it means is accompany. You see, we're supposed to be close to Jesus. In other words, Jesus is with you and you're walking along and you're laughing and you're sharing what's going on. Following Jesus means you're with him. Come on, somebody. Like you get to be with him and he's with you and he's right there walking with you as you follow him. And he's like, hey, put your cross on today, but I'm right here with you. I'm beside you. We're together and we're walking on this journey together. We're supposed to be close to Jesus on this journey. So you can't really follow Jesus in that death march kind of way because that's not what it means. That's not even available to you. That would just be taking on dead religion and burdens and baggage. But when you know Jesus and, and he knows you and you're with him, this whole thing, even the process of dying to yourself is a completely different matter because you're with him and he's with you. And what ultimately following Jesus means is that he gets a hold of your heart and that you become internally aligned with him. See, until you get internal alignment, you're never gonna get external transformation. Until he gets a hold of your heart and you're with him on the path, and you kind of know, man, when, when, when we get to this type of a place, Jesus, he goes to the left, and so I go to the left. You know, when, when, we, when we get to this type of a decision or a situation, Jesus goes this direction, that's the way I go. And you begin to internalize the path and the way of Jesus. And that internal alignment leads to external transformation. And people begin to look at your life and say, wow, you're really different. And you're like, oh, really? I, I am? You see... The process of change and growth as a Christian is very, very rarely noticed when you're on that journey. Like usually what happens is you wake up one day and you look back and you're like, man, I'm so different than I was five years ago. But there was never a point at which I thought, I'm growing. It's so funny, you know, with kids, like my daughter, Evie, she's like nine feet tall. I'm like, when did that happen? Because I remember when you were just a crumb cruncher, you know, this little tiny thing just in my arms, this little tiny girl. Now you're this young woman. She's six years old and she's tall. And I'm like, when did that happen? There was never a day when I was like, whoa, you just grew a foot. <laughs> never happened. With Jesus, so oftentimes it's just this relationship. We're on this journey with him. We're walking with him and he's with us. And all of a sudden you look back and you're like, man, we've covered a lot of ground. But it wasn't this death march. It was you were with him. And I think when we talk about this, about giving our life away and embracing this new way to be human, what we want to get to is that our hope and our focus and our purpose should be to be with Jesus rather than doing stuff for Jesus. See, as a Christian, if you're more concerned about being with him, I just want to be with him. So if Jesus is serving the poor and the downtrodden, if Jesus is serving, if Jesus is laying his life down, I just want to be with him. So that's where I'll be but not because I'm, I'm awesome and I'm doing what Jesus does. No, it's like, I just want to be with him. Sometimes my wife will say, hey, I'm going to run an errand down to Fred Meyer or whatever. Say, yeah, I just want to be with you. I'll just come with you. Which, and that in our family means me and the kids sit in the car and she goes and does what she needs to do. But I just, I just want that 10 minutes in the car with my wife. Well, why? Well, because it's so romantic to sit in the car for 10 minutes. No, it's not. And I'm just going to sit on my phone when she's in there and read about the ducks, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because I want to be with her. Does that make sense? It's a relationship. When, when we have this mindset with Christ, it's not about doing stuff for, it's about being with. To follow Jesus means to accompany, to walk together. It's this brand new way to be human, this new way of life where we don't hold on, we learn to let go, where we don't always look to receive and acquire, but we look to give it away. How many of you are excited in, over the next couple of weeks to learn about this, this new way of life, learning to give it away? Well, the very first step that you can take, I know every single week people show up in this movie theater right here on Sunday mornings at Joy Church. And maybe you think I'm just here because I saw 
a TV commercial or I got a flyer or a friend invited me, but that was the mechanism by which you were brought here. But let me tell you the reason that you're here, why you're here is because God loves you so much and he drew you and brought you to this place. And maybe he used a TV commercial or a Facebook ad or a flyer or a friend, but he brought you here because he loves you, because he wants to know you. And the very first step to, to learn how to walk with Jesus is to give your life to him to give it away. The very first step you take on this new way to be human is to say, I don't trust in my own righteousness, my own goodness. I don't trust in my ability to earn favor with God, but I'm gonna give my life to him and I'm gonna allow him to lead me on this journey.